Well, today we're going to pull back the curtain and talk about the angelic realm. Is it true that angels are referred to as divine? And does God give authority to an angelic council? All these questions and more coming up. This is the Bible Sojourner, where we discuss issues related to the Bible, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, professor of Old Testament and biblical languages at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Shalom and welcome. Thanks for joining. Welcome back to the Bible Sojourner. Today we're going to be talking about angels and the divine council worldview, which is popularized by Michael Heiser. And we're going to talk about this from a couple different perspectives. And I think this is of interest to many people. At least I've gotten quite a few comments and questions about it through emails and comments. And I think even when I'm teaching Old Testament studies classes, people are really interested in the idea of how angels intersect with the human realm. And so we want to talk about this. And I think one of the biggest ahas for me was when I picked up this book, The Unseen Realm, and I started reading it. This was six or seven years ago, I think. And I read it just because it was really popular making waves already. And I remember being introduced to some concepts that I hadn't really thought about before with regard to the ways that certain passages are understood and how angels seem to be mentioned in some really peculiar places in the Old Testament and in the New Testament for that matter. And I think Michael Heiser, although he doesn't really offer brand new material, he's relying a lot on ancient sources. He does such a great job in packaging the material in an understandable way that you can easily understand whether you agree with him or not. And so I've gotten a lot of people asking questions about Mike Heiser. And so I wanna talk about this issue for two reasons. On the one hand, obviously it's important to discuss, you know, what do we think about Mike Heiser and his book, The Unseen Realm, and all of his work on angels and demons, how should we think about that? But then second of all, it's just a super fascinating subject, right? When we talk about angels and how the, heavenly realm intersects with the human realm, there are a lot of things that are helpful in in understanding the Old Testament, as well as specific passages which intersect with our life. And so we're going to go through that today. So a couple notes as we get started here about Mike Heiser and Shepherd's Theological Seminary, because this this was kind of cool. I didn't know this until actually a couple of years after I had already been working at Shepherd's Mike Heiser was actually saved in Dave Burgraff's youth group, which Dave is one of the systematic theology professors, uh, uh, historical theology professors at Shepherd's Theological Seminary as well. And it's just really cool to see that connection. In fact, they kept up a really strong relationship. Dave was meeting with Mike, even uh, Mike passed away. Mike Heiser passed away in February of 2023 due to cancer and Dave Burgraff had been visiting him, helping out, even helped out a little bit with the funeral. So there is a close connection there that I wasn't really aware of when I moved here. And I think that's that's kind of cool to see how that worked. And then even more so, you had Mike Heiser a- attending classes under Doug Bookman when I think Bookman was teaching at Pillsbury Bible College, if I remember correctly. So there were a lot of interesting connections there. And I I personally got to meet Mike a few times, talk with him. He had me as a guest on his podcast, which is perhaps provocatively titled the Naked Bible Podcast. It It's a little more provocative than the Bible Sojourner, but uh, we will allow it, I suppose. And so I, I talked on his podcast about the Queen of Heaven and what that might be uh, in Jeremiah. And so we had a great time talking about that. I really appreciated the opportunity to do that. So he passed away in 2023, and it was incredibly sad for many people. Obviously, he was well-loved. And one of the things that made him beloved by many is just his total disregard for trying to uh, be politically correct. He just said, hey, this is what I think this text means, and let's just see, let's go with it. And so people really appreciated that about him. And so I think he's very clear in how he writes. You know, if you disagree with him, which I disagree with him plenty on different things, but I really appreciate the clarity with which he speaks and writes. And and so I I think it'll be really helpful to go through this. And so we're going to talk about 
the angelic realm and what Mike Heiser calls the divine council. So when we're talking about this divine council worldview, or he calls it the divine council worldview or divine council biblical theology, uh, what are we talking about? So it's really important to differentiate that there have been historical studies done on this previous. So Mike Heiser isn't the first one to come up with these terms or ideas, but in the past, liberal theologians have used the idea of a divine council as, as a kind of backdrop to the evolution of Yahweh religion. So when liberal theologians have talked about the divine council worldview, they typically picture it as in Canaanite religion, ancient Near Eastern religion, you have a pantheon of gods in a divine council, and they're all essentially co-equal. Maybe there's some differences in power, but over time, Israel evolves, and perhaps the Bible does not give us an accurate picture about how Israel became a nation. This is the liberal viewpoint. And so over time, Yahweh evolves and he becomes the head of the pantheon. And then eventually Israel evolves into a monotheistic religion. But at the very outset, Israel, like other Canaanites, they, they thought Yahweh was just one of the other gods. And so there are remnants of that theology in the Hebrew Bible. So that's often cases when you're reading older resources on the divine council, what you're going to read in liberal theologian discussions. But that's not what Heiser means when, when he talks about that. That's clearly unorthodox, by the way, to, to say that God is just one God of many and he's equal with others and he's just fighting uh, amongst the gods for superiority or supremacy. Obviously, that is unscriptural, anti-biblical. You're looking at the text, that's not what you see. You basically are coming at the text with presuppositions of Darwinian uh, religious evolution. And so those are the things that are at play when you embrace liberalism and the development of Israelite religion uh, as Yahweh, as one of the gods that already exist in a pantheon of gods. Okay. And Yahweh uh, could be identified as Baal in, or Baal, as we often call him in many of these uh, texts. So that's, that's often the liberal view. But what we're talking about here, according to Heiser's view and, and many others now who have, who have kind of adopted this viewpoint, is that angels, so angels, so they're not uh, co-equal gods, but these divine beings, uh, these heavenly beings, which we identify most commonly as angels, are given special tasks and involved in an authoritative role and an authoritative task. Now, in order to support this kind of idea, I want to work through a few texts that I think can be helpful in kind of showing the role and responsibility of angels as we see it in Scripture. So to start off, I want to show us the Job 38 text. And the reason we're in Job is I date Job very early, so I date it earlier than Genesis. Even if we don't, it's talking about a very early time. So in Job 38, verse 4, and really we're going through verse 7, we're told, where were you? This is God talking to Job. So where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. So we're talking about creation. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So when we're viewing this text, verse 7 is the key ingredient, but to get the context, he's talking about when I created the world, where were you, when all these things took place. And of course, the rhetorical point is that, Job, you were nowhere. You didn't have anything to say about this. But in verse 7, we're told that the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So almost everybody that I'm aware of attributes the meaning of this text to angels. So uh, these heavenly beings, the sons of God that are shouting for joy or the morning stars, oftentimes, and we'll see this later as well, but oftentimes you have stars being associated with divine beings in the ancient Near East. So the Hebrew parallelism here, when it says the morning stars sang for joy, the sons of God shouted for joy, those that parallelism shows that we're talking about some sort of heavenly 
you could say divine being, but remember I'm using divine, not in the sense of how we think monotheistically, but in the sense of dealing with heaven. So heavenly beings, these angels, these sons of God shouted for joy. So apparently the heavenly beings are alive and created uh, when God is creating the rest of creation. Okay. And I think that that is, that's interesting to say the least, that the angels were somehow around, and, and you might say, why? I think God is is creating the angels first. And by the way, this is the only indication we have that the angels may have been created prior to the rest of creation. I know a lot of people have different ideas about when the angels were created, but it seems to me on the basis of Job 38 that the angels are singing for joy when God is creating everything. And so that seems to be, in my understanding, that the angels were created first so that God could show off and show how amazing he is. And I think that that is a reasonable conjecture, although we don't have a lot on that. I just think if the angels are shouting for joy during creation, that would seem to indicate they were created before creation. How far before, we don't know, but they are they seem to be uh, around when God is creating uh, everything else. Now, another thing that people don't really kind of get is that the angels had a had a special role in the giving of the law as well. And so we can see that in Acts 7.38. We read, this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai with our fathers. He received the living oracles uh, to give to us. So notice that an angel is speaking to speaking to him there, and obviously we're talking about Moses. And it's interesting when you have this reference to an angel speaking to him at Mount Sinai. And normally you think to yourself, okay, well, obviously God was speaking to Moses at Mount Sinai, giving him the law. Well, yes, but at the same time, we're told that the angels were involved in the process somehow, and 738 seems to say that. You also have Galatians 3.19, which says, uh, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put, put in place through angels by an intermediary. So again, we have Paul just kind of giving a a point which he doesn't expect there to be any disagreement on. He's just saying, listen, the law was put in place by angels. So there, and we have no indication that this happened in the Old Testament. I don't see any reference to it. Maybe somebody else could find one, but I, I don't see anything there that, that indicates that to us. This seems to be Paul gleaning this through some other means, God revealing it to him or, or Paul just understanding uh, what's going on there. And so, Regardless, the point is that angels seem to be given some very important responsibilities as being a part of creation. They have a prominent role at creation. They also have this responsibility as as uh, administrators or deliverers of the law, according to Acts 7.38 and Galatians 3.19. And then we have Job, which is really kind of fascinating because in Job 1, we're told that there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now that phrase, that context there, regardless of the whole story, uh, most of the listeners are probably familiar with it anyway, but what I want to zero in on right here is why is it that there's, there's a specific day when the sons of God, the angels, are presenting themselves before the Lord? Now, not to read too much into it because I don't think we can exactly, but based on what the text says, there it, there was a specific time when the expectation was that all the sons of God were to gather with Yahweh for some reason. We don't know really what it is. Uh, people like Heiser or others might say, well, this is evidence that they were getting together to make certain decisions. Well, that's possible. We're not told, but there's some reason that they're gathering together, some reason that they're gathering together. And we see another indication of that in uh, Job 2, 1. In verse 2, it says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. So again, we have another text which seems to indicate 
that there's a specific time when the angels would gather around the Lord. Now, they're called sons of God here, and we're going to talk more about that in just a moment, but it's actually very, very, well, it's not very rare, but it's it's more rare to have angels referred to as angels. It's more common in the Old Testament, at least, to have them referred to as sons of God or um, not to jump completely before, you know, <laughs> not to jump the gun or put the cart before the horse. I almost mix those two metaphors. But the Bible also refers to them as gods or as Elohim. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to keep talking about this special authority that angels seem to exercise. And in the book of Deuteronomy, we also see this take place. In Deuteronomy 4.19, we are given indication that the angels have a special significant role to play among the nations. So this is Moses' warning to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 4.19. He says, And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. So in other words, what Moses seems to be saying is don't don't go after the sun, the moon, and the stars. And I think uh, it's it again. This is a bit of a difference between us and as a, as naturalistic humanistic society. But in the ancient world, uh, stars were often associated with heavenly beings, divine beings, and so the the assumption here is that the nations are going to worship these other beings, these other heavenly bodies, if you will. But you must worship Yahweh, and so I think that there there's something to be said about that. Uh, how the nations were going to be uh, seduced to go after these other gods, these other divine beings, if you will. But Israel was to be reminded that they needed to be pursuing Yahweh. Now, I want to, along that point, later on in Deuteronomy, this is a very key text in understanding this whole issue about whether or not there's there's some divine authority or divine counsel, some sort of heavenly counsel with angelic figures as a part of this. And that's in Deuteronomy 32. Because in Deuteronomy 32, this is the ESV uh, that I'm reading here. When the Most High, so the context here is, is when God has divided the nations. So when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, most people are willing to say, okay, that's talking about Genesis 10. You know, he's dividing mankind according to their nations. It says, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So in other words, uh, God seems to be saying that the borders of the peoples he allotted according to the number of the sons of God. Now, who are the sons of God there? Well, those would be the B'nai Elohim is the Hebrew term there that those would be the angels. Those are the same sons of God that would be referenced in Job 1, Job 2, uh, and elsewhere. Now, just a note there, though, that in the Legacy Standard Bible and the New American Standard Bible, you'll actually read a different reading. So there you'll read that he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel, not according to the numbers of the sons of God. And so the Masoretic text actually does read B'nai Yisrael, and that's uh, Hebrew for sons of Israel. So the question is, well, why, why do some translations say sons of God then? Well, because the oldest Hebrew text that we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls reads sons of God, and the Greek Septuagint, the first translation we have of the Hebrew Bible, also reads sons of God, or the equivalent actually, uh, I have the Septuagint here in front of me, and it's actually Angelon Theu, which is angels of God, according to the numbers of angels of God, which angels is is a, a pretty common translation for sons of God. And so when you when you read that, what you're seeing here is an understanding that the oldest text we have from the Hebrew Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls says it should be sons of God. You have the First translation of the Old Testament that we have in Deuteronomy 32.8, the Greek Bible says it should be angels, sons of God. And so how did, how did a different reading show up the sons of Israel? Well, 
I think the Sons of Israel reading is one of those where uh, perhaps a scribe um, later on says, okay, you know what, sons of God, that, that is Israel. So let's just specify that, that, that the sons of God are equal with Israel. And so there's a slight change that takes place there. It's a textual critical issue. But I do think the majority of the evidence, you know, I think, I think yeah, it's, in my mind, it's, it's pretty clear that it should be uh, sons of God rather than sons of Israel. And so what that would mean then, if that's true, it is a textual issue. But if, if, the, if the issue is it should be translated sons of God, what the text is saying is that the boundaries of the nations were allotted according to the angels somehow. Now, by the way, what would it mean if it was according to the numbers of the sons of Israel? That doesn't really, there's, there's, it's less sensical that way, at least in my mind. I'm sure some people have other uh, interpretations of this passage, but if, if the peoples are set in their boundaries according to the number of the sons of Israel, what would that mean? Israel, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure how to, how to understand that, where all the nations were to be given uh, authority under Israel. Maybe that's the only way that you have to say it, but that, that never happened. And so that, that's difficult for me to reconcile with, with actually what's going on in Genesis 10 and following. So I think what, what's being talked about in this passage is that you have God talking about how he's dispersing the nations and he's saying he's giving authority, uh, a, he, he's setting the boundaries of the people according to the sons of God, according to the angelic witness. And as you read that, the reason I think that this makes such uh, makes a lot of sense is because this is what you see later on in places like Daniel. Now, we just get brief glimpses of this, but you have Daniel uh, talking with the angel who's come to, to give him uh, revelation. And so as you have the angel talking to Daniel, he said, listen, I came because of your words. That's verse 12 of Daniel 10. But then in verse 13, he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now, he's not talking about humans there. I don't know anyone who thinks that he's talking about a human. He's saying the leader or the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, well, again, who's Michael? Well, we know that he is a chief angel prince, right? So yeah, it's just such a fascinating just uh, snippet here in the middle of Daniel where you're, you're being told about angelic warfare, basically. And the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, this messenger angel, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So again, there seems to be some specific angels that are associated with Persia here. And as we, as we go on, um, we're told that, uh, well, there's, there's actually a couple of different uh, observations to make from this text. So the angel says, uh, do you know why I've come to you? This is verse 20. After he describes his battle and all that, he says, now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. Now, in context there, is he talking about human beings? I don't think so. I think he's talking about angelic leaders that are associated with specific nations, okay? So he's talking about the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, and, and then he says, though, in verse 21, but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. And you might say, what do you mean, Michael, your prince? Well, in Daniel 12, you have an uh, interesting text where you have uh, verse 1, at that time shall arise Michael. So this is talking about in the future, there's going to come tribulation and all that. And in verse 1, it says, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. So you're like, what? Well, who is your people there? Obviously for Daniel, that's the Israelites, right? And then he says, there shall never be, or there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. So in other words, uh, this is this is why the tribulation is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble, because there this is the trouble which is given to the nation of Israel that has never existed prior to this time. And what what is going to be significant about that time is Michael is going to come, uh, he's going to arise and he's going to uh, protect and help the people of Israel. Okay, so this is a very fascinating glimpse. Apparently, Michael 
is the angel who is in charge of Israel. So listen, I'm just trying to read the text and make, make sense of it just, just like you are. And, and as we go through that, I think we actually see that, okay, Deuteronomy 32, there are nations that are allotted according to the number of the sons of God. So there are nations that are allotted under the authority of other, other angelic beings. And then we also have, we also have uh, Daniel giving glimpses of that. You have the princes of Persia, kings of Persia, which seem to be very clear uh, references to angels. And then you have Michael being associated with Israel. Now you also have uh, glimpses into stories where God interacts with these angels. And one of the you know, craziest stories is in 1 Kings 22. And you have a prophet by the name of Micaiah, and basically Jehoshaphat uh, is is talking with Micaiah. And in, in verse nineteen, you have Micaiah being mandated to to deliver a prophecy about what's going on and and what he has seen. So in in verse nineteen, Micaiah says, "Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing beside him." on his right hand and on his left. So who are the host of heaven? Well, those are the heavenly beings. Those are the angels, right? And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramot Gilead? And one said one thing and another said another thing. So who is the one that says one thing and another that says another? These are angels talking with one another. They're, they're brainstorming as to what can be done. Okay, that seems to be the indication of the text. And then in verse 21, a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. So this is talking about all the false prophets, which were telling uh, the coalition between Ahab and Jehoshaphat that, you know, you're going to be victorious. Israel and Judah will be victorious in battle. And so all the false prophets were saying that. And so a Apparently, what had been the backstory to this is that a false, uh, a, a false spirit had been sent to be in the mouth of these prophets and to, and to do this. So he said to them, this is in the middle of verse 22, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do it. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets, and the Lord has declared disaster for you. So again, when we're looking at this, we, yeah, I, I'm not sure if there's, if there's another way to, to think about this. Basically, in 1 Kings 22 here, you have, you have this provocative story where, where God is talking with the angels about what should be done, and he's allowing them to contribute somehow, and they, they do that. They, they talk about what should be done or couldn't be done, and God says, Yes, we will do that. You will succeed. Now, that doesn't mean that God isn't in control or that he doesn't know all things. You could go crazy just isolating a text of scripture and not, uh, not uh, or, or reading your presuppositions into it by isolating it, right? So what we, what we understand is that God is allowing a real contribution on behalf of the angels, but at the same time, he's the ultimate one who's in authority and in control, and he's the one who decides what should be done because he knows best. All those things can be completely true. They don't have to be exclusive. And so there seems to be examples like this where angelic figures are are responsible for for contributing authoritatively and uh, administratively, and they're, they're helping accomplish what God wants to do, even by, it seems, brainstorming with that. Now, again, that doesn't mean that God doesn't need them, but that's part of the reality is, does Let's take a step back here for just a second and talk about this because I think the main hang up for people when they're thinking about this is that God is somehow lessened by allowing the angels to contribute in such ways like this. But what exactly did God do with humans? God does the same thing with humans, right? God gave human beings as image bearers of God the responsibility and and role as being a vice regent on his behalf to be caretakers of the world for him. And so even though God has complete authority, even though he never has relinquished that authority, he has shared that authority as part of his good plan in order to accomplish his plan. 
So just, God does does the same thing with humans. It shouldn't necessarily surprise us that God also allows angels to contribute in a specific real way. Okay, that 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 shouldn't be very difficult for us based on our understanding of of humanity. Now I want to go. You say, okay, well, is there anything else on this? Well, I think Psalm eighty two is actually a confirmation of what we've been talking about here. So in Psalm eighty two. We have a Psalm of Asaph, and we're told that God has taken. So, so again, uh, a, this is this is a Psalm which which kind of gives us a behind the scenes view of God's interaction with with angels. So, in Psalm eighty two, it says God has taken His place in the divine council. That's where we get the idea of the divine council worldview. Okay, so the divine council there is the, the word council of God. That's why it's translated divine counsel. And then it says in the next phrase, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, what about the New American Standard? The New American Standard translates that word uh, in the midst of the rulers. So I know a lot of people want to take, and the word here, if you can read Hebrew, is Elohim. But you probably recognize the word even if you can't read Hebrew. So the word is Elohim, but it's translated by some commentaries and translations like the New American Standard as rulers. Now, I will say uh, I appreciate how the Legacy Standard Bible has updated that. So those of you who use the Legacy, I know there's many of you. uh, I appreciate how the Legacy Standard Bible has updated the NASB translation to say he judges in the midst of the gods. So that is much more, uh, in my opinion, authentic and helpfully tied to the text. Now, the issue of how do people translate it as judges? Well, it's because there are some passages of Scripture where where it's possible that Elohim is a reference to human judges or rulers. Now, I will say I don't agree with that because I've looked at those passages and I think it should just be understood as God. It, it, in context, it's, it's like passages in Judges 21 where somebody goes before uh, goes before Elohim and makes a vow. And so some commentators have said, well, Obviously, they're they're going before judges to make the vow. No, I mean, I say he goes before God. He goes to the tabernacle and makes the vow. Um, I don't think it has to be human judges. So the point is that I think you have to take Elohim as gods here. I don't think you can take it as human rulers. And I think just taking it at face value then, what it's saying is that God takes a seat in this council where there are other Elohim around the table. Now, you might be really starting to sweat, you know, bullets right now, and you're starting to squirm a little bit, and you have ants in your pants because you're saying, wait a second. So you're saying that the Bible says there are other gods, and God is just one God. I mean, you're starting to sound like a liberal, Peter. You know, settle down. Okay, you settle down. Okay, what we're talking about here is you need to understand the semantic range of the word Elohim and gods. And we'll talk more about that later. But first, I want to get you to the point of understanding Psalm 82. Okay, so what Psalm 82 says, just at face value, is that God is seated with other, we'll call them heavenly beings. Okay, so he's seated with other heavenly beings and he's lashing into them. He says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So he's, he's laying into them for doing a poor job at administrating and, and being, uh, uh, being justice oriented. So in verse six, he says, I said, you are gods, son of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. So again, in six and seven, we seem to have an indication that uh, these are real Elohim that he's talking to. He's not talking to people. And the word there again is Elohim when he just says, um, I said to you, you are gods. Um, Elohim atem in Hebrew, which is just you are gods. And so just straight, straightforward, you know, this, he seems to be saying you are uh, Elohim. This is your function. This is your status. You are sons of the most high, just in case you didn't know what that is, but like men, you will die. Now, I've had people say, well, if it is talking about gods, what would that phrase like men you shall die mean? Well, again, I think that um, death is in many ways understood. Uh, 
death is not meant to be understood as a cessation of existence. I don't think in any context a Christian would be, well, an Orthodox Christian would be okay with that. So we would understand death as being, you know, the same as for a human. They are they are associated with the lake of fire at the end. They are bound for eternity. So I think this is just talking about the judgment that is coming upon the angelic realm. I think that that's that's very similar to how human beings are talked about with regard to the second death. And again, there, you just have to use the term death, right? So I think that that's what's going on. So Psalm 82 seems to be a discussion about how God is is upset with the angelic realm, those divine figures who are supposed to be, they're, they're supposed to be ruling the world. Remember, this is the Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9 passage where the peoples are allotted uh, according to the number of the sons of God. So in other words, there's charge given over the different nations uh, by the angels, and yet they're doing a poor job. And as part of that, then you have Psalm 82, where God promises judgment upon them because they are doing such a poor job. Now let's go back to what we talked about previously, right? Uh, Is it okay that we have angels referred to as gods then, or these heavenly beings how, how are we to understand this? And I, I know it's uncomfortable for some of us, and that's partly because we are really entrenched in this idea of monotheism means nobody else can be called God at all. But unfortunately, the Hebrew Bible doesn't, uh, I mean, it came before all of our definitions and things like that, right? So when you think of the word Elohim, so the word in Hebrew, Elohim, is the word, the primary word for God. There are other words, but Elohim is the main word for generic reference to God in the Hebrew Bible. And you have Yahweh being the specific name of God, which again, make that's why the Legacy Standard Bible is, is a really neat translation, just like the Holman Christian used to do, is they actually reference when Yahweh is being referenced. And that's, that's really neat. But I want to talk about the broad use of of Elohim, that it, it's, it is more complex than it, it doesn't just refer to God or false gods. That's often how we picture it, but there's actually a broader use. And I think that this is helpful to understand. So I don't think we need to look at some examples. I think you know that oftentimes Elohim does just refer to Yahweh, the God of Israel. So Genesis 1, for example, uses Elohim. God said this, God did this, God saw that it was good. All those are references to Elohim, the one true God. You also have, like what we just looked at in Psalm 82, if the foregoing theory is correct, you have Psalm 82 referencing uh, these members of Yahweh's administrative staff, if you will, as Elohim. So that's not a disaster per se. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, But you also have false gods and goddesses of other nations being referred to as Elohim. And just for sake of time, you can just look at Judges 11.24 or 1 Kings 11.33. In those texts, you have other gods being referenced. And this happens quite regularly, honestly, throughout the Old Testament, where you have gods of other nations being referred to with this term. And that that's okay. But what's really kind of fascinating is in Deuteronomy 32 again, you have in verse 17... Uh, a reference to demons as Elohim. So in, in 17, uh, Deuteronomy 32, 17. Now I have a, I have a bone to pick with the ESV here, but I'll read it anyway. So in 17, it says they sacrificed to demons that were no gods to gods. They had never known. Now I, I like the legacy. It does a better job here because the word is actually singular. So it says they sacrificed to demons who were not God, singular. Because this is one of the interesting places where the, the word for God here is actually in the singular, which normally it's a, it's a frozen plural form. But here in verse 17, it's actually a singular. So it, it literally reads, they sacrificed to demons who were not God. And then the next phrase is, they sacrificed, implied, to gods, plural, whom they have not known. So in this case, who are the Elohim? Who are the gods that are referenced? Well, in context, it is the demons. The demons are the ones who were referenced here. They they sacrificed to demons. They sacrificed to gods whom they 
had not known. So here you have demons, which is the word shadim in in Hebrew, uh, very uh, very different than and can't be confused with other terms. And so you have demons clearly referenced here and then paralleled with the idea of gods. So demons and gods are put side by side here. And I think that that's an important uh, understanding uh, of what's what's going on. Perhaps, and, and I think maybe one of the most fascinating examples is in 1 Samuel 28, 13 of the use of Elohim. Because in 1 Samuel 28, 13, the context here again is Samuel has died and Saul is in trouble. And so he goes to see the witch of Endor. And when he goes to see the witch of Endor, he asks her to call up Samuel. And so she does. And the king says to her, do not be afraid because, you know, she realizes that this is Saul and it's a capital offense to be a necromancer. But she so she's scared. But Saul says, don't be afraid. Nothing's going to happen to you. Uh, Verse 13. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming out of the earth. Now, depending on what translation you have, some translations might say, I see one like a God coming out of the earth. But in Hebrew, it just says, I see an Elohim. I see an Elohim coming out of the earth. And so Samuel's spirit form is referred to as an Elohim. And so again, it's one of those things where, okay, either she's wrong and somebody, some people might say, well, she's not a trustworthy character. She thinks that she sees a God, but it's not really a God. Well, again, I think you're, I think we're stretching if you're going down that road because there are so many uses of Elohim uh, which which break outside the pattern of a re- of a reference to the true God of Israel that we have to start considering all these different definitions. Uh, maybe another one which would be, yeah, I think I think just really easy to see is Psalm eight five, and in Psalm eight five you have uh, David's reflection on what it means to be a human being. And he says, yet you have made him a little, uh, made him a little lower than the Elohim. Talking about, uh, verse 4 probably gives us, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Verse 5 then says, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, the, the, the Elohim. Legacy uh, translates it as angels, but the word is Elohim. Now, the reason the legacy is, I think, on point with the translation here, they can translate it as angels. Because the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation, and Hebrews 2, in reference to this passage, understands it as a reference to angels. So again, we have the reference to Elohim, but it's, that's in contrast, by the way, to the New American Standard, which translates it as God. Yet you have made him a little lower than God, Elohim. But I do think if, if you're following the train of thought here, if you're understanding what I'm trying to say, the word Elohim in the Hebrew Bible is a little broader than just a reference to God. In fact, the way I think we should understand uh, the, the word Elohim or the idea of Elohim is that it's a term that tells us uh, n- not identity as much as the, the realm in which one functions. Now, Elohim, Yahweh, the the God of Israel, is the Elohim of all Elohim. He is superior in the category of Elohim. But according to the Bible, there are other Elohim that are real and that they they have existence in Scripture, okay? And so basically, an Elohim is just one that exists in the spiritual world. That's, I think, how we understand putting all of the the uses, you can do your own searches on the word Elohim and track them down just like I painted the picture for you. But I think when we do so, we are going to arrive at the same conclusion that we're looking at the Elohim of Scripture, looking at the references to the term Elohim, we're going to realize that, okay, it's broader than just a reference to God. And so there, there really are real uh, multiplicity of Elohim. Now, that does not because here's the thing that does not imply that they are equal with God. Okay. It's, it's a term talking about functionality. It's a term talking about the belonging to a spiritual realm, but scripture is clear that 
Yahweh is superior among the Elohim, the other Elohim. So for example, you have Exodus, I'm just going to read some because uh, for sake of time, uh, Exodus 15, 11, who is like you among the gods, Yahweh? And it's a rhetorical question. Obviously, no one is like Yahweh. Uh, you have Deuteronomy 3, 24, what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do according to your works and according to your mighty deeds? Well, again, rhetorical. No one can do it. Yahweh, you are superior. Uh, 1 Kings 8, 23. O Yahweh, God of Israel, there is no God like you in the heavens above or on the earth beneath. So again, you have just so many texts like this. You also have texts like Psalm 29, 1 and 2, which give commands to other Elohim. So listen to this. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Now think about this one. If, uh, and the word there is, it's slightly different. It's B'nai Elim, which is another variation for sons of God. And some people try to translate it as uh, strong, strong beings or strong sons. But, but really, again, I think uh, that's just because our presupposition, we don't want to allow it to be, because what this verse would be saying then is that there are real heavenly beings which need and necessitate to worship Yahweh then, just like human beings, right? And, and I don't think there's any problem with that. I, I think just taking Psalm 29 at face value, uh, Psalm 97, 9 is similar where you have, uh, you, O Yahweh, are most high over all the earth. You are highly exalted above all gods. Well, that, those kinds of verses would be pretty meaningless if there, if there were no other Elohim out there. And so I think these passages don't really make much sense unless there are specific actual uh, Elohim in, in existence. Uh, we could call them angels. We can call them demons. Remember, it's just a broad category of spiritual beings in existence. And so I think this is how the Hebrew Bible talks about this realm. And I think as we talked about with the divine council, you, you do have spiritual now it's not all of them. I I do think, uh, and this is perhaps another podcast, a time something for for a different time. But there is certainly a hierarchy within the angelic order. So that's not saying all angels have the same authorities or anything like that. Even in Daniel, we saw the reference to the kings of Persia and the princes of Persia, the prince of Greece, etc. So there is certainly a hierarchy within the angelic order. That's something we can. Uh, even in the New Testament, you hear reference to principalities and powers. So there are different categories of angelic existence. Okay, it's fascinating stuff. So I'm not saying all uh, angels are the same. There does seem to be a higher echelon of angelic activity, which we could refer to as the divine council, where God interacts with them, gives them authority in certain situations. Uh, now, again, that doesn't mean that God relinquishes his sovereignty or authority. No, that, that, those don't have to be uh, mutually exclusive. I would still say he is sovereign. I would still say that he's in control, but he's also allowing angels to, like human beings, have a vicarious representation on his behalf. And so I think that's something we need to consider biblically. Uh, last thing that some people might throw out there is, doesn't the Bible explicitly declare there are no other gods? Uh, and so texts like Isaiah 45, 6, uh, Isaiah prophesying that, uh, that God does what he does, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the West, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, 35 is similar to you. It was shown that you might know that the Lord is God and there is no other besides him. So just viewing that it is possible that we could, we could say that there is there is no other existence of spiritual beings other than God. We could somehow interpret it that way. But I think it's helpful to look at comparative phrases in Isaiah 47, 8, Zeph Zephaniah 2, 15, where we see the same phrase that's applied to cities. And cities obviously would know that they're not the only city. But, but look at uh, in Isaiah 47, 8, Now therefore hear this, you lover of pleasures, who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. So notice this is an arrogant city that's talking about this saying, I am and there is no one besides me. 
Well, obviously, it's not a reference to the fact that there are no other cities. It's talking about comparability. Same thing with Zephaniah 2.15. This is the exultant city that lived securely, that said in her heart, I am and there is no one else. What a desolation she has become, a lair for wild beasts. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. So these statements, the I am and there is no other, uh, seem to focus on incomparability, not on existence. In other words, I, as, as we, I hope, made a clear case, there are references where scripture says there are other Elohim. In fact, the other Elohim are commanded to give praise to God because those are just statements of functionality within the spirit realm. But that doesn't mean that Yahweh is like the other Elohim. He is incomparable. He is so far above. He created all the other Elohim. And so when we think of when we think of this, I think we just need to be specific and we're not, you know, diving into heresy. I think uh the the danger that and the reason people really struggle with this is because when we think of monotheism, we say, well, there can be no other gods. There are no other gods. But the and <laughs> The, the problem is that the word translated God in the Old Testament is Elohim. And so we say there are no other gods, but the Bible says there are other gods. Well, okay, so you know what I'm saying is that we run into a language barrier. It's a language problem. We know that there are no other gods in the sense that God is the sole creator and he creates all other things. But there are beings, heavenly beings, divine beings, however you want to label them, that are called gods, they're called Elohim in, in the Bible. And so we need to acknowledge that both of those things are true. Theologically, God is the sole creator. He's the sole authority. He is the sole God. So obviously we're monotheists. But at the same time, as we look through scripture, there are labels given to the angelic realm because of their function as being spirit realm participants where they are called Elohim. And so I think we just need to understand that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that there are there's a hierarchy among the angelic realm where angels hold a divine council status where God gives them special authority over the nations and they're they're participating in that. I think that that is what scripture teaches. It seems to be pretty clear. Psalm 82 seems to be uh helpfully uh explaining that as well. And I think that in in holding all these things together, I think we can appreciate some of the contributions that uh, Michael Heiser has made. Uh, he's he's really popularized a lot of these ideas at uh, at a layman's level. Uh, it's it's fairly easy to understand. Now, I will say as a clarification that uh, you know while I appreciate all those things that he's brought out, I don't follow Heiser's conclusions uh, down the road. Right, uh, like um, for example, Heiser in in his discussion of the conquest thinks that the conquest is basically all related to the divine council worldview, how the conquest, the reason God is sending Israel to, to conquer the, uh, the land of Canaan is because of this, uh, this angelic warfare or this spiritual uh, divine council, which obviously needs, uh, you know, the Genesis 6 interaction between humans and angels has messed things up, and so there needs to be a purge. And so that's, that's partly why Canaan is, is invaded and things like that. I don't see I don't see that as the primary point of the text. Well, to be honest, I don't see that in the text at all. And so there there are a lot of uh, issues that I have with some of the conclusions that Heiser ends up drawing. So I whenever I recommend Heiser, I say he's got like a lot of really good stuff on just talking about the role of angels and what they do. But you know, just like anything, even even Heiser himself was was really well established and and adamant that people need to learn to think and they can't just accept things just because people tell them that. So, you know, I always say um, Heiser is very provocative, um, but I don't agree with what everything he says. You know, I'm maybe 50-50 or 60-40 on what he says a lot of times, but this is one area where I think the Bible's pretty clear. And so if the Bible's clear on something, I want to, I want to talk about it. I want to teach it. And so when we talk about a divine counsel, I don't think that that's unbiblical or uh, or there's any problems with that. I just think it's it's pretty clear from scripture. And so hopefully as you study these passages and look through the importance of angels and how they function behind the scenes, you can, you know, 
enjoy part of that uh, enjoy that part of the story as well. So I hope this has been helpful for you. I know it's a lot of fun to think about, but it's also a lot to think about. So if you have any questions, uh, follow up thoughts, I always love hearing from listeners and viewers. So feel free to reach out through the contact form on my website, petergaiman.com. If you want more information about Shepherd's Theological Seminary, where I teach, you can visit shepherds.edu. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.